as a society, our quest for authenticity is never ending. I don't think we'll ever feel like I live in an authentic world where I know what everyone is thinking, I can believe what everyone is saying, and I can make decisions based off of factual information that is not colored by bias. I'm Lindsay P. Brackett. And I'm Christy Ann Hunter. And you're listening to A Rough Draft Life, where we're all making it up as we go along. Welcome back, Lindsay. Well, welcome back, Christy. And well, it's not like you and I haven't talked to each other over the last few months, but we have not shared those conversations with all of our podcast friends. Right. We have missed our podcast listeners, and we are so excited to finally be back with you. And we really feel like this is going to be our best season ever. We actually spent the last few months talking about what we wanted to share with you guys, what we really wanted this podcast to be, how we wanted to grow ourselves using this podcast and let you guys hopefully grow along with us. As such, we are making a few changes. Because both of us needed to recognize that there is such a thing as quality over quantity, and we only want to deliver quality episodes to you, we have decided it's probably going to be best if we drop back to an every other week format. So every other week, you'll get a new Rough Draft Life episode right there in your podcast feed, or however you choose to subscribe. But extra special is that if you become a Patreon subscriber, you can get extra bonus episodes twice a month as well. And those are something we've never done before. So what that means is you can still listen to us every Monday if you want to, but the normal A Rough Draft Life episodes will only happen twice a month. So how that's going to work is on the first and third Mondays, you'll get a regular Rough Draft Life episode where we will talk about something in our life that may need a little editing. And then on our off weeks, we'll be dropping bonus content um, available for uh, Patreon subscribers. And if you're interested in following us on Patreon, there will be a link up on our website, roughdraftlife.com, or you can find that information on Instagram. So the second Monday of every month, you'll get me, and I'll be talking about a story from the Bible. Basically, it's going to be story time with Christy, and it's going to be maybe a story you're a little familiar with, but you might not have gotten all the story when you heard it in Sunday school. So Christy is really going to talk about, you know, how in Sunday school, when you're a kid and you learn about Noah's Ark, they always stop before the part about how Noah got drunk and was naked. Yeah. <laughs> you like, you like that naked? That's Southern for. That's very naked. Southern for, there were no clothes on and shenanigans were happening. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> And on um, the fourth Monday of the month, you're going to get me and a little something that Christy and I have joked about for years, but we're doing it. It's called Not Your Grandma's Christian Fiction. And I'm going to be talking about books that have both Christian elements as well as books that are published by Christian publishers. And we're going to really take a deep dive on what does it mean to be a book that has elements of Christianity? What makes a book Christian fiction and what makes a book stand out in that category, really. So some things you might not have thought would be found in the pages of a Christian book, Lindsay is going to set you straight. <laughs> For those of you who follow me on Instagram, you know that I read widely and eclectically. So we will be seeing books from all over, from general market publishers as well as Christian publishers. We're going to see some old school books. We're going to see some brand new books. Sometimes we're going to get to chat with the authors. It's going to be really fun. If there happens to be a fifth Monday in the month, you'll get Lindsay and I sharing uh, what we're loving, how things are doing, just a general chit-chatty episode. And that will also be delightful, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're always delightful. We are. But Christy, I think we also need to let our listeners know, you know, we've kind of had a pretty big summer, both of us. Lots going on. Our lives have definitely changed. <laughs> So in the spirit of, you know, your life is a rough draft, and what that means is you can make changes. You can deviate from the course you thought you were on. I know that I have written many a novel where the finished product is quite different from the rough draft. <laughs> I don't think I've written one yet where it looks the same at the time it gets to the end. <laughs> Definitely not. So the biggest adjustment in my own personal life, um, for those of you who do follow me on my personal Instagram, Lindsay P. Brackett, you may have seen that I went back to school as in I am now back in a classroom as a full-time teacher, not just substitute teaching. 
I am teaching middle school drama at my daughter's middle school. And yes, she's in my class. It's fun. It's exhausting. It's different. Um, there's a lot to talk about that I'm sure will come up in episodes. But just know that it's been a really exciting time in my life to recognize that the course that I thought the Lord had laid out for me is actually just a little different. So if you follow me, you have no idea what I've been up to because I have not actually publicly shared this yet. But over the summer, it was decided that my book that comes out in March, Enchanting the Heiress, is going to be the last one that I do with Bethany House. So I am currently completely revising how my writing life will look. So don't panic. More books are coming. They just will not be coming from Bethany House. And we might at some point actually do an episode where we talk a little bit about the publishing industry, which we've done before. We had a long conversation with Teresa Tysinger about the differences between traditional hybrid and indie publishing. But at some point, we may have a little like recap on what the publishing marketplace looks like right now for those of you who are interested. But just know um, Christy and I are both really excited, really committed to our careers as authors, to bringing stories to you. But, you know, life again, it's a rough draft. And sometimes you have to make changes. Sometimes you do. And sometimes those changes end up being for the better. So far, what is shaking out is to be the next steps for me look very exciting. So I know I'm excited for Christy's next changes, y'all. Like, I can't tell you what they are. I just want you to know that you're going to be excited too. <laughs> All of that is kind of the update. That's what we've been up to over the last few months and what's coming for you this year. But as exciting as all that information is, what they really want to know is what's today's episode? Well, you know, Christy, some people read the titles of podcasts before they listen to them. We are really interested in having what feels like a very transparent conversation with you about the topic of authenticity. We chose this topic as the opening for this season because by far the thing that has driven both Christy and I to really examine our careers, to examine our lives, to examine the podcast and its goals is the desire both of us have to be authentic. We simply don't want to create content for the sake of creating content. We want to create content that is useful, that is meaningful, that you can share with a friend, that you can share with a family member, that you can listen to in your morning walk and get something out of it. And one of those big desires for us is that we do so authentically, which is why it's important to me that I share with you things that are going on in my personal life that may not affect the podcast as much, like taking this full-time job. But at the same time, that was a huge driver for why we chose to back off um, regular weekly content. And so we wanted to have this conversation and we wanted to open up our new format with you by talking about it, because the reason it came about was I was reading a book, shocker. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens. Never. And it was, it's an old book. All right. So it's an old Michael Crichton novel titled Timeline. And the reason I was reading it is because there was a movie that came out and y'all came out in like 2004. It has Gerard Butler in it. And I just need you to know that of all the actors in this movie, Gerard Butler is the only one still making movies. I'm pretty sure. And he <laughs> is like young and he's a knight, and he wields a sword, and you want to go watch this movie. I know you do, but it's called Timeline. So it is about this group of archaeologists who wind up having to go back in time and save their professor, save the man who's in charge of the archaeological dig, because as they are excavating the site, they find a note from him that's dated, I can't even remember the year of the story, it's the 13th, 14th century, so 13 something something is what it's dated, and when they type the ink and everything, like it really is dated that. And they're like, how in the world can this letter be from him now? And so they have to go and they, they find out that the people who fund their project actually have built a time machine. And so they go back in time in order to save the professor because he's stuck back there. They can't seem to get him back. And it's just a real, it's an interesting story. Um, it's interesting about the history of France during that time period. It's interesting about, you know, our obsession with the past as well as our obsession with science and developments. But I never knew it was based on a novel. I've always really liked this story. There's a little bit of a love story to it. Christy knows I love a good love story. <laughs> my husband and I rewatched it recently. And at the end, we were watching the credits. And at the end, it said, based on the novel by Michael Crichton. And I was like, what? So Does he guess have what any I did? books that have not been made into movies? Listen, did you also know that Michael Crichton created ER? Like, I'm, I think he and Stephen King and James Patterson and Nora Roberts really actually run the world. Secretly. <laughs> 
anyway, I did the lovely like hold at the library. And of course my book came in right away because who's reading a book that came out 20 years ago? Apparently not a lot of people at my library. And I thought, am I really going to read this? I think I read Jurassic Park. Did you read Jurassic Park? No, I tried reading a Michael Crichton book once because uh, I think my dad had one and I just, I don't think I was ready for it. I think I was a little too young when I tried to read it. Listen, it's like a textbook. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. And of course it was published 20 years ago. So publishing was very different. Expectations of readers were very different then, but it is very textbooky. Like it is simultaneous. Well, there was a, there was a time period right there where the male oriented fiction for lack of a better phrasing of it mm -hmm. was very textbooky you know you had john gersham you had all those books then that were very like lots of information packed into those pages so see i never felt like john gersham was like a textbook but well, it always had lots of law stuff in it I guess he had mm -hmm. yeah, you know it had it lots of the details of what's going on I was probably just more interested in his content, <laughs> yeah. whereas this one was very sciencey, and y'all, science is really not my thing. <laughs> so, but it was very sciencey. It was also very historical, and so it was a really dense read. And at first, like I know the story, so I'm thinking I'm probably not really going to read this whole thing. I just kind of want to skim through it and see how close it is to the movie. Well, I wound up reading the whole thing because, of course, what is the answer to how much is it like the movie? What do you think? Zero. <laughs> Oh, not zero. About 50%. Okay. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> Healthy 50%. And so I also thought it was really interesting that I got a lot more character backstory, obviously, from reading the novel. So I was like, oh, now it makes sense why they had her do this thing in the movie that I never could understand why she was the one who did it. <laughs> it's because, obviously, she's a mountain climber and we were just supposed to in, like know that from watching the movie. But the thing that struck me as I was reading the story and the thing that, like, to bring this full circle back to the podcast is there's a line in this book, y'all, this book was written, had to have been written like no earlier than probably 95 or 96. It was published in 97, 98. Okay. But this is the line. Authenticity will be the buzzword of the 21st century. Christy, do you hear people talk a lot about authenticity? So much, so much about authenticity. And I think this is one of those things that goes back to what we have talked about before, where people have always been people. That 20 years ago, it was still like people were like, they crave something authentic. Mm -hmm. And what I thought was really interesting is he actually goes on to talk about, and the man who is speaking in the story at this time is the man who has invented this time machine. He's this brilliant physicist. He is a terrible person, but he is a brilliant physicist. And he talks about what is authentic, anything that is not devised and structured to make a profit anything that is not controlled by corporations, anything that exists for its own sake, that assumes its own shape. But of course, nothing in the modern world is allowed to assume its own shape. Now, the character's point is that he's getting to this idea of where he basically wants to monetize the past. He wants to use his time machine to go back and see what the past was like authentically, so then it can be recreated in the 21st century, and you can have an authentic, immersive experience in the 14th century. Right. That's that's his, like, point within the story. Let me tell you what I know about the 14th century. No one wants an authentic, immersive experience in the 14th century. You're going to get the plague or be run through with a sword. Like, and it's going to stink and you have to go to the bathroom in, like, rushes in the corner. Let's not even talk about it. <laughs> but I read that with my 21st century eyes here in 2021. And the first thing that comes to my mind is social media. The first thing that came to my mind when you sent that to me and we were just talking about people craving authenticity is the reputation that social media influencers have. So people who are actually making a living on social media. Which reminds me, I started listening to a podcast over the summer called Under the Influence, and it is like a deep dive into the world of Instagram influencers. Um, language alert, just so you know, don't listen to it with the kids around, but really interesting. And it's one of those things where I am very curious as to why Instagram influencers get such a bad rep because like they're required to tell you it's an ad, hashtag ad is supposed to be in there. And so there's some transparency in that and required transparency, but we've been advertised to our whole lives. So what is it about Instagram influencers? That why make is it that double? Instagram influencers get a bad rep for advertising to us? Because there are people who make a living advertising things to us. I think the deeper question is, why do we feel betrayed 
when we learn that this person who has 1.2 million followers on Instagram is actually being paid for their content. Why do we feel betrayed by that as their follower? I think that might be one of the questions. I think that is true because like when you go watch an ad for whatever comes up on your Hulu, on your TV, however you're watching TV now, if it has an ad on your YouTube. Hulu has in, re, has introduced my children to the world of commercials and they think it is terrible. They're oh, like, yeah. <laughs> not, they, when we watch Full House on Hulu, they're like, mom and dad, was this what it was like in the 1900s? <laughs> I love how they're getting a real big kick out of calling it the 1900s. Like, they really kids, are. They really love are. Call that. And we're like, yes, yes, back in the old days. And you know what else? We can only watch one episode a week. And if you missed it too bad. <laughs> yep. And, and you couldn't pause it if your brother or sister wasn't back from the kitchen with the snack shit. <laughs> but we aren't mad about those. We're irritated because like, oh, commercial. But nobody sits there and bad mouths the person who created or sold that ad. Exactly. Like it's understood that this is a price you have to pay in order to have this particular content. But on social media, we feel like we should not be getting this. What I really loved about this passage was where, you know, he says, authenticity comes from anything that is devised and structured so it doesn't make a profit. Well, if you look at the history of social media, Facebook originally came about simply to be a connection point, to be a connection place. Right. And it's for college students, you know, it was not for all the rest of us. I was too old for Facebook. Yes. Now you've got everything from, you know, Facebook and Instagram all the way to TikTok and all the other things. And they are absolutely designed to make a profit. And I think we feel like that's not fair. By making it a profit, we have now made it not an authentic thing. Because I will be straight up honest with you listeners. I use Facebook for one purpose and one purpose only now. And that is to promote content for what I do as an author. I do get on there and kind of check in with high school friends. I have some groups I belong to. But the truth is, if I want to know what's happening in one of my close personal friends' lives, I pick up my phone and I call or I text. I do not check their Facebook status. I think that there is this idea of as more and more of the paid and kind of curated content gets put out onto social media and you and I are part of that. We are selling things. (laughs) Transparently, authentically. We are selling things. I mean, I'm selling my own product. So most people don't feel like that's advertising, so to speak, but in a way it is. But as more and more of that curated content gets put out, we start feeling like our friends are curating their content more and more as well. I think think with Instagram influencers, part of the problem, maybe not problem, because I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not calling them a problem. I think part of our response to feeling that they are inauthentic is that by far what you have is a group of women, almost always women, mothers, many children, oftentimes, Mm -hmm. beautiful homes talented decorators. They have leveraged their personal talents and their personal lives for monetary gain. And I think people feel like that's not fair. And the thing is, while I personally have no desire to do that, who am I to judge the person who does? How is that different than the mom who makes crafts and then decides to sell them on Etsy? Right. So I have a sister who is, I have two actually, two sisters who are, who who would be considered influencers. Um, One more Facebook, larger following there, one more on Instagram. I don't really look or watch their content. People sometimes send me messages and ask me if I've seen this. And I don't look at it because I talk to them in real life. They're my sisters. But the truth is, I, I have heard them say most everything that I hear them say on social media. And I do believe that they are being authentic, but they're able to do it in a way that, yes, it does ultimately at the end of the day, sell you a product, sell you an idea, sell you a concept. And that's something that both of them have chosen to do. Well, one of them, that's her full-time income is marketing. And then the other one is it's a side income. It's a side hobby, but it's helpful. (laughs) Well, I think anybody who's going to be consistent enough to make a living, there has to be a level of authenticity to it because you can only maintain a facade for so long before you burn out. That is very good. That is very good. So there is a level of authenticity to it. And it's interesting because what you'll have is the people who are really good at it, they'll start feeling like your friend. And then you realize they don't know me from anybody. And then you have to- That's start... where people feel betrayed. I That's think. where people, that person doesn't respond to my comments. That person doesn't respond to my messages, things like that. And that's where people start feeling betrayed because it's not an authentic friendship. 
Right. They may be authentically putting them their real selves out there, but the connection you feel is mm -hmm. not authentic. And I think that is where certain people, particularly over the last couple of years, as you know, connections and our connection points in our community has shifted and changed or been cut off. You know, we want those authentic connections and those are harder to find when you have to make them through some type of media. Yeah, there's always going to be a barrier there mm -hmm. for the most part. That's trending over into a lot of other areas of life. As we start questioning the authenticity of our friendships and connections and the more we're seeing how things are filtered because we know how we filter our lives onto social media. And so you have to start thinking everybody else is filtering that as well. And I personally start realizing I even filter personal conversations that I have in a certain way, depending on who I'm talking to. I will share certain things or, you know, not share certain things depending on the friendship that is there or the connect connection that's there. And that does not make you an inauthentic person. It does not. It makes you a person who is aware of the levels of connection you have with these certain people. This week, I put up an Instagram post about cooking okra, which transparency and authentically, I actually picked and cook okra on a regular basis. It's something I do. However, what I didn't put up was a post about what a bad day I had at work. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel that that makes me inauthentic. My audience isn't coming to my Instagram because they want to hear me um, complain about how hard it's been for me to come back into a classroom after 10 years. They want to know what books I'm reading and what I'm cooking for dinner. And so right. that I'm giving them the content that they are looking for in what I believe to be an authentic way. But I'm also recognizing that our connection is not such that these are the people I'm going to for spiritual or life advice on how to manage this huge transition that I'm currently undergoing. And I think we are translating that as we all become more aware of the depth of our authenticity in certain places, I think we're translating that to other areas of life as well. I see a lot of people really questioning where they get their news. And we're not gonna get into the content of different news sources, but I'm just going to say, I think there's a lot more people who are like, I don't wanna go to the big news because it goes back to what the book was saying about things that are orchestrated for profit. Mm -hmm. And we start realizing, hey, if this is a TV channel or even a paid newspaper or something like that, they're starting to question, are you filtering this because I'm paying you and you want me to keep paying you? Right. And so I think you're seeing, a, I'm seeing a lot of small news organizations that like send their news out via email or via social media. There, There's Instagram news sites now. And I think people are changing how they go and find other information because they want something that feels more authentic. Even though the truth is, at the end of the day, everybody has to make money. Right. As a society, our quest for authenticity is never ending. I don't think we'll ever feel like I live in an authentic world where I know what everyone is thinking, I can believe what everyone is saying, and I can make decisions based off of factual information that is not colored by bias. I don't think we will ever live in that world. But our desire for it drives us to look for all these different avenues where we think we can find it. If I can see inside this celebrity's home, then I can see that the celebrity is just like me. Mm -hmm. And then I can feel that I have a relationship with Jennifer Gardner. I hate to tell you, she probably doesn't know who you are. <laughs> she probably doesn't even manage her own account. Probably not. The question is, as we talk about like, how do we edit this desire for authenticity? Because I think it's one of those, what we've touched on is we crave it. We want authenticity in our life. And yet we have all learned so much about the back end of the machine, so to speak, mm -hmm. that we're maybe more suspect of it than we used to be. So the question is, how do we feed that craving for authenticity? I think for all of us, one of the things we've learned in the last 18 months is that maybe our circle is not quite as big as we think it is. And that maybe the circle that, is, that we have of close friends, family, the people that we are willing to either put on a mask to see or socially distance with on a porch or be inside a home together because we all feel comfortable doing that together. Those are the people that we are actually living our truest authentic life with. 
And it's okay that you only have a small handful of people to do that with. We actually don't need hundreds of thousands of people to, do, to live that life with. We're not, we're not really created to be able to develop that many relationships. And I think this quest for authenticity has us thinking that we can have that many authentic relationships with lots and lots and lots of people. And the truth is you simply cannot. No, psychologically, I think we've talked about this before, where there are circles of what you're able to maintain. And like that closest circle is only like five or six spaces. You can only maintain like five or six super close relationships. And then I think the next circle out that's like your really close friends is maybe like 15 to 20, I think is what the number is. So like you're talking 30 people you can have what I would call a fairly authentic relationship with. 30. I have friends that we used to call it tiers. You have your mm -hmm. tier one friends, you have your tier two friends, you have your tier three friends. And we used to say it sarcastically because there was a group we wanted to be in with that we weren't in the tier one for. Yeah. But now I actually look back on that and I think there's a lot of truth to it. Your there really is. It's the psychological mm -hmm. studies that mm -hmm. there is truth to that. And I think what we're saying here as we bring this, this first episode to a close is we are so grateful to be in the tier with you. And we understand that authentically, it is impossible for us to have the kind of connections that are close and personal with every single person who listens to the podcast or who interacts with us on social media. But we want you to know that it is part of our goal to always present content that we believe is valuable for your time. And that is as best we can, as authentic as possible to what we believe and what we're trying to say. So I think that the end line there is authentic relationships don't always have to be full. I think is, I think is kind of what you're getting at is we can authentically connect with you, but you're not going to know the inner workings of our bad days. And we're not going to know the inner workings of yours, but we're so glad that we have this space where we can connect on some level mm -hmm. in the most authentic way possible for that level. Yes. And we are grateful for the gifts that social media has given us for all the, you know, for all the damage that it causes. It also gives really good things. Mm -hmm. It does. It has allowed me to make an authentic, if like tier three or four connection with people I would never be able to connect with in any other way. And so I think it's recognizing that you can have authenticity that is not complete, I think is very important. And when we start realizing that authenticity does not mean complete transparency, then that is where we can start valuing things for what they are and for what they're given. And that is what I have been trying to do with some of my connections, because as you said, over the last couple of years, I have learned that my bubble is different than I thought it was. My inner circles are different than I maybe thought they were. Mm -hmm. And that has changed my view of some of those outer circles. And I'm valuing those for what they are. And that makes my life a lot better because I'm not trying to move things to a place that they don't belong. And I think if we start looking at our life with our connection to each other, our connections to personalities that we meet online, our connections even to companies and businesses and news sources and everything else that we let into our lives, and we put them at their appropriate places and judge the authenticity for, okay, I am authentically connected to them at this point. I right. think that is when we can start constructing a life that we really feel more settled in. I love that you said that we feel more settled in because I think that's what we're all striving for. We're all striving for a life that feels content and that feels real and live to the best of our ability. And we hope that by joining us we here weekly that we are able to just give you some little nuggets of wisdom that maybe don't come from us. Maybe they come from people like Michael Crichton <laughs> that help you think through um, these topics that are such a important part of our culture today. As always, thank you to our patrons. We love sharing our extra episodes with you over on Patreon. Everyone can get bonus content by following us on Instagram at A Rough Draft Life. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, review, send to a friend. We love sharing our Rough Draft Life with you. Now go out, edit your life, and make tomorrow better than today.